Hello, I'm Mark and welcome to The Sim Hanger, the Sim Hanger for all things flight sim related. Now, there's certainly quite a bit of change in the flight sim market at the moment. Microsoft have announced hardware specifications, including graphics cards, for the upcoming Microsoft Flight Simulator. Prepared version 5 has been released, featuring Microsoft's DX12. And X-Plane, well, they're in 11.5 beta with the new Vulkan API. Whether you're new to Flight Sim, looking to upgrade an existing system, or perhaps even replace your existing system, I've put together a number of recommendations in terms of suggested graphic cards, and they're based on both price and performance level. We'll look at an entry level to give you decent 1080p performance, an entry level for VR, the mid-range level giving you 1440p, as well as a high-end and extreme graphics as well. My recommendations are not based on the respective developer's minimum specifications, and they're also not based on a vanilla install of the respective flight simulator. It's no good throwing a whole lot of gaming benchmarks at you because in the flight sim world, they're largely irrelevant. And as we move up through the performance categories, so I've assumed a certain amount of aircraft and scenery have been added. All the prices that I quote are in English pounds, but I find that the euro and the US dollar price is often very similar. But take the pricing purely as a guide. If you're in a hurry, well, there's some timestamps in the notes below. Let's get started. Choosing the right graphics card for your flight simulation requirements can be a confusing and daunting task. It depends on various factors such as budget, level of detail, how much add-on aircraft and scenery are you planning to use. In addition, the developer's recommendations can be equally confusing. Bear in mind that their recommendations will always tend to be the minimum required. Let's have a quick look at some of the developer's recommendations. The recently released specifications for Microsoft Flight Simulator under minimum include the GTX 770 and under recommended specification the GTX 970. Both of these cards are discontinued and have been for the last 18 months. Under the ideal specification, the Radon 7, if it hasn't been discontinued, well, it's about to be shortly. Moving on to Laminar Research's X-Plane, they say their minimum is 1 gigabyte. The program will run at 1 gigabyte, but it won't be a very enjoyable experience. They go on to recommend 4 gigabyte, something I consider as a minimum with the new Vulkan API. Prepared is 4 gigabyte with a recommended 8 gigabyte with an Nvidia Force, I think they mean their RTX 2080 Ti. Whilst our focus today is strictly on graphics cards, of course getting a good system performance is a combination of your system components. Overall system performance is not limited to your graphics card, but your CPU and your main system memory, amongst other things. There are two main graphic card manufacturers, NVIDIA and AMD. So in each category, we're going to look at a graphics card, one from each manufacturer. Let's kick off with those on a budget with some entry-level cards, sub £200, but those that will provide an acceptable 1080p performance with some add-ons. The AMD Radon RX 580 graphics card is often overlooked and underrated. Let's take a look at one of MSI's offerings. For a card well below the £200 threshold, you get a card running at 1366MHz and a stonking 8GB of memory. Yes, it's GDDR5 memory, which is slower than the latest iterations, but 8GB? Wow! It has a wealth of connectors, including two display ports, one DVI and two HMDI. It's FreeSync compatible and supports up to four displays simultaneously. One 8-pin power adapter, drawing 185 watts, so you'll need a 500 watt power supply to run this one. Available from a wide range of manufacturers, prices ranging from 165 to 200 pounds. 
My choice for the entry level from NVIDIA is the GTX 1650 Super. This is one of the newer GTX cards issued featuring the 12 nanometer Turing architecture. It's shorter in length than most cards so will fit if you're tight for space. This graphic card features 1280 cores and 4 gigabytes of memory. 4 gigabytes being the minimum I would recommend. Price band is between 150 and 200 pounds with an average of about 170 pounds, making it on average about 15 pounds cheaper than the RX 580. A more modern architecture, but only half the RAM. Let's take a look at one of MSI's offerings. It's the GTX 650 Super Ventus. Running at a faster clock speed than the RX 580, it can boost up to 1740 megahertz. However, it's running on a narrower bus at 128-bit. Whilst only 4GB, it is GDDR6 memory. This card has one DP port, one DVI and one HMDI. It can support up to three displays. It's got one 6-pin power adapter, so it only draws 100 watts. So for those of you with a 350-watt power supply, this is the ideal card for you. So oh, out of the two cards in the entry level, what would be my recommendation between the RX 580 and the GTX 1650 Super? Well, I'm going to have to plumb for the AMD offering, the RX 580, simply because it's got double the video memory at 8 gigabyte. Yes, it's a few pounds more, but for double the memory, well, I think it's a good deal. The 1650, of course, is always worth a look if you're tight on space or you've got a small power supply as the 1650 only draws 100 watts. Flight simulation in VR needs a little bit more grunt and my choice is the GTX 660 Super from NVIDIA. Once again based on the Turing architecture and featuring a fast 6GB GDDR6 memory. Featuring a twin fan design this again is a relatively short card so will fit in tight spaces. Let's take a look at EVGA's Black Edition. The card runs at 1530 MHz but with a boost to just under 1800 Meg. Supports three displays through a DP, DVI and HDMI port. Only one display port on this card is a bit of a disadvantage for this card for some of the newer VR headsets. Prices range from 220 to 260 pounds and averages out at about 235 pounds for the card making it about £65 more expensive than the 550. The AMD offering in this category is the RX 5600 XT card, featuring the RDNA architecture on 7 nanometer silicon. At launch this card was plagued with driver problems, but AMD have overcome these, and now the card can provide a great performance. Let's have a look at an offering from MSI, their Mech graphics card. This card also offers a 192-bit bus, but can run up to 1600 MHz on boost. And like its NVIDIA counterpart, offers 6GB of GDDR6 memory. FreeSync compatible with 4 display, 3 display ports and 1 HMDI. This card requires 1 8-pin power adapter and will draw about 150 watts. Prices range from 260 to about 300 pounds with an average of about 280 pounds. In terms of both specification and performance, there's not a lot to choose from between the two cards, with the 5600 XT just tipping the scale slightly in its favour. The NVIDIA card is cheaper than the AMD offering, but nonetheless I'm going to opt for the 5600 XT. And that's mainly because it's got three display ports, compared to the 1660's single display port. Many monitors these days operate at their fastest speed using a display port and nearly all modern VR headsets also require a display port and that's certainly a potential limitation as far as the 1660 Super is concerned.
We're now entering more serious territory with our mid-range cards. And my first recommendation is from AMD, it's the RX 5700 XT. The XFX card has typical performance. Let's take a look. This card comes with 8GB of fast memory and is built on a 256-bit bus and capable of a boost clock of just over 1900 MHz. Supporting four displays with 3DP and one HDMI port, this card has the performance characteristics to give you a comfortable 1440p experience. With improved drivers, especially for Vulkan, X-Plane users are going to get a really good boost with this card. Requires one 6-pin and one 8-pin power adapter, so you're going to need a power supply of around about 600 watts. Price points vary from 370 to about 450 pounds with an average price of 430 pounds. So a mid-range card clocking in comfortably below 500 pounds. For the Nvidia offering, I'm suggesting the RTX 2070 Super. This card is very comfortable at 1440p. It features 8GB of GDDR6 fast memory and quite a step up in cores to 2560. Whilst not necessarily applicable to Flight Sim, this is the first card that offers ray tracing capabilities, as well as the NVIDIA Tensor cores to help with processing. Running at 1600 MHz, it can boost to 1815, and the memory bus speed is 256-bit and running on PCI3. Let's take a look at some of the specs for the Gigabyte Gaming OC. Once again, it's based on NVIDIA's 12 nanometer architecture capable of supporting four displays it's got three display ports and one hmdi power is one six pin and one eight pin you'll need a 650 watt power supply to support this prices vary from 490 to 540 with an average of about 520 pounds for the rtx 2070 super for those of you with older cards, the GTX 1080 holds its own in this category. And the same can be said for AMD's Vega 64. Both of these cards are very comfortable running at 1440p and both will give you a great VR experience all the way up to the higher resolution headsets such as the HP Reverb. The RTX 2070 Super does have a performance benefit of about 10 to 15 percent over its AMD rival. Nonetheless, my choice is based on price, with the AMD offering being about a hundred pounds cheaper. I've got to go for the RX 5700 XT. Up to this point, there's been a fairly direct relationship between the graphic card performance and the price. As we move further up the performance scale, the economies for bang for your buck go out the window, and cards from this point on do attract a premium price. Cards in this category are capable of 4K resolutions, although if you're using ray tracing, you may have to dial them back to 1440p. Not an issue for flight simmers at this time. Our first card in this category is the NVIDIA RTX 2080 Super. Featuring 3072 cores, a boost clock rate of 1815 MHz and 8 GB of fast memory. Our example card we're going to look at is the Gigabyte Turbo 8G. Having 8 GB of memory, it's hitting the sweet spot in terms of flight sim performance. The memory bus is 256-bit and it features three display ports, one HMDI and one USB Type-C port. It's capable of supporting four monitors. It's ray tracing and DLSS enabled. One 6-pin and one 8-pin power adapter is required and a 650-watt power supply is recommended. Prices for this card vary from about £700 through to about 750 and will probably average out around 720 to 730 pounds. AMD's offering in this category is the Radon 7 graphics card. However, AMD have all but announced that this card is now end of life. You can still find the card in some system builds, but finding the card on its own, it's a rarity now. 
and I believe the card is no longer shipping from AMD to component retailers. This card has massive compute capabilities, but was originally intended for the enterprise market rather than the gaming market. At time of release, the Radon 7 was selling for around about £700, yet performance-wise, only a nominal improvement over the RX 5700 XT. Subsequently, prices had to drop into the 400 category, the result being it's not an economic proposition for AMD to retail this card. And to be honest, it doesn't really hold its own against the RTX 2080 Super. Despite its impressive specifications, including 16 gigabytes of memory, ProRata performance is lackluster. It's also a vain noisy card. For those with the GTX 1080 Ti, well, your card fits into this category. Compared to the 2080 Super, performance is similar, around about 5 to 10% slower at higher resolutions. Well, for me, the choice for high-end graphics card is really a no-brainer. It's got to be NVIDIA's RTX 2080 Super, giving a great 4K performance and very comfortable in VR as well. AMD, well, they just don't have anything able to compete in this category. Well, not yet anyway. Right now, there's only one readily available card that fits into this category. It's from NVIDIA and it's the RTX 2080 Ti. Whilst it may change in the future, AMD have nothing to compete with at this time. This card is a monster in terms of its performance and its price. Based on the 12 nanometer Turing architecture, it features 4,352 cores and an impressive 11 gigabytes of memory. Let's take a look at the EVGA Black Edition, featuring a boost clock up to 1545 MHz on a 352-baht memory bus, PCIe 3, and it can support four displays. Two 8-pin connectors are required to power this card, and it draws 250 watt, so a 650 watt power supply is recommended. If you're on Windows, this is a Windows 10 only card. Prices start at just below £1,100 and all the way up. With no competition, NVIDIA is saying if you want the best performance, you've got to pay for it. Well, the undisputed king of graphics cards, and winning by default as there's no opposition, is NVIDIA's RTX 2080 Ti. It's a substantial card with great performance, but at an equally sizable price. You're certainly paying a premium. Now there's rumours in the market that both NVIDIA and AMD have got something new coming up which is going to rival and probably surpass the 2080 Ti. Well, that'll be subject of a future video. So in summary, the red team represents best bang for your buck in the entry to mid-levels. However, at the higher level, the green team NVIDIA remained totally dominant and almost unchallenged. 
Well, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and tap the bell for future notifications so you're aware as and when I release videos. And if you like the video, don't forget to give me a thumbs up. It certainly helps me. I hope you found this video useful and informative. Thank you very much for joining me. Take care and bye for now.